historical explanations for differences in the development indicators of the developing countries. Devraj Ray, Chapter 2. Now he says this, that if you look at the period of 1960 to 1985, you will find this, that the world's uh, richest 5% of the countries, they have the per capita income, which is 29 times more than the poorest 5%. And this remains more or less stable for the entire period. So this is the one characteristic. Let us uh, just write this together. One. Over 1960 to 1985, the relative distribution, because when you are saying this, that for such a long time, the top 5% of the population has the per capita income of, which is 29 times more than the bottom 5% population, uh, sorry, for bottom 5% of the, of the countries in the income scale, you will find this that this, this means that the income distribution it remains relatively stable. The rich remain rich and the poor, they remain poor. The relative distribution of world's income remain stable, right? So per capita income of top 5% richest countries is 29 times the per capita income of 5% poorest countries, right? Uh, so, but uh, I mean, of course, as far as inequality is concerned, this seems to be staggering, but at the same time, the distribution, it remained more or less same. That is one characteristic, right? Second. Second characteristic, right? Uh, there has been uh, uh, some movement in the income distribution within the uh, within the countries. So it's not that uh, okay. The world distribution it remained more or less constant, right? But uh, within the different countries, there have been some movement. So how uh, how do you say so? Uh, there has been little movement. There has been little movement of countries within the world distribution. In this period, ke andar, what happened was that uh, there was uh, uh, in 1980s, you'll find this that East Asian economies, they, they really developed quite fast, right? So there was a meteoric rise of uh, the East Asian uh, economies. One thing was sure, right? Uh, then you have, so let me just write a few points within this. In 1980s, There was a rise of East Asian economies. East Asian economies, 
right? And this could have been possible because of the far-sighted government intervention. So the governments in these economies, they had uh, they had invested in such kind of projects, which led to the development of these countries. So this can be possible because of uh, used uh, very good words, far-sighted. government intervention right second latin america latin america it faced debt crisis So its growth was halted. So there were few countries which were going up and the few countries which were going down. Uh, one thing was there. Uh, and uh, it, of course, it led to a huge economic hardship uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. in sub-Saharan Africa, right, uh, we find the low per capita incomes. But those low per capita incomes were due to what? They were due to the unstable government. And this has been true even now. I mean, you look at the governments in Sudan, South Sudan, you find this, there is a lot of political instability uh, throughout this, this region of sub-Saharan Africa. Unstable governments. So you need a political stability for economic growth. Unstable uh, government. And uh, then you have the infrastructural breakdown. infrastructural breakdown, right? And also the high rates of population. High rates of population. So all of this had led to the problems in the sub-Saharan Africa. So what has happened is that there were few countries which might be growing little uh, I mean, at the higher rate earlier, in this period, they, they went down, for example, Latin America. And there were few countries which had the meteoric rise, for example, East Asian countries, right? Uh, so, so, but there's no one reason that uh, why some countries it grew, they, they actually grew faster than the other countries, uh, they, they, they uh, grew very slow uh, or they went down also because I've given you the different reasons. So Latin American countries, they faced different problems. Uh, Sub-Saharan uh, countries, they faced different problems and so on. And then uh, the point is uh, some countries that change their relative position. So the few countries which were, uh, which were very low in the income ladder, they went up. And the some countries uh, which were in the middle income ladder, they actually went up. So, and there was a high probability of those countries which are among the middle. So they were the countries which are in the, among the top, then middle and then lower. So the countries which actually grew very fast, those were the countries which were in the middle income ladder. Right. Some countries uh, Some countries have changed their relative positions.
some countries have changed their relative positions, right? And uh, and you know what? Uh, mm, he writes a very good line. He says this, that if there is a history of wealth, history of wealth means that if you were wealthy to start with or you were fairly wealthy to start with, there's a high chance that you can be wealthy in, in the future. But if, we're, if we were poor to start with, then you can also foretell that you are going to be poor in the future also. There's a high probability, right? And this there's a beautiful line which he, which he says. Uh, let me just write the complete line. So first line, he says, some countries have changed their relative positions. Uh, suggest that. Suggest that there are no ultimate traps to development. So this is the positive line which says this, that even if you are lower, you can go up. Right. But in the next line itself, he says this, that at the same time, a history of wealth or a history of poverty can foretell that what you will be in the future. So if you were wealthy to start with, there is a high chance that you will be wealthy in the future. If you were uh, uh, poor to start with, there is a high chance that you will be poor in the future. Right. At the same time, it's a beautiful line and a very powerful line, which he says at the same time. A history of wealth or poverty does seem to Partly foretell future developments. Future developments, right? Uh, so, and the mobility of the country is uh, uh, continues to be highest somewhere in the middle income ladder. So, if you were uh, the middle income country to start with, you are at the middle level of development, there's a high chance that you can go up. Huh? So, the mobility. These are beautiful lines which he has written. The mobility of countries appears to be highest somewhere somewhere in the middle of the wealth distribution. Right. And then he says this, whereas if you have the history of underdevelopment, so if you were a country uh, which was very, very poor to start with, for example, maybe a sub-Saharan uh, country or sub-Saharan African country, uh, or you were the country with the extreme poverty, then there is a high chance that uh, that historical fact that you were poor to start with, that is going to put you at disadvantage. Uh, whereas, a 
a history. of history of underdevelopment or extreme poverty appears to put countries at a disadvantage, right? And then he says something else. He says this, that, uh, um, see, poor countries, uh, I mean, those countries which were poor to start with, don't think that uh, that poverty, that historical poverty is going to be only a disadvantage for them. That can also prove to be advantageous for them. He says, how? Uh, so, don't you think that uh, these poor countries, they can actually use the technical know and how which is which is being developed by the developed countries. And they can just use it. They do not have to spend a lot in R&D or innovation, one thing. Uh, uh, so, and because the capital is scarce in these poor countries, so the capital can earn a lot of profit in these countries. Whatever is scarce is going to get higher price, right? So they can learn also at the same time, they can see what others, what, what mistakes others have done. And they may not be able to, they, they may not repeat these mistakes. So those are the things because they are, they are far behind the development ladder. They can see how others have developed and they can copy that. And they may not do their, uh, do the mistakes which others had made, right? So, poor countries do seem to have some advantages to what kind of advantages, right? Uh, they can use relatively free of charge the technologies which have been developed by the other countries. They do not have to put in a lot of investment in R&D. They can just use the technologies which have been developed by the other countries. They can use relatively free of charge Jeez. that are developed that are developed by their richer counterparts right They can also learn from the mistakes which their counterparts have done, their richer counterparts have done, and they may not they may not be repeating those mistakes again. They can learn. They 
mistakes. That they are predecessors. Predecessors have made right. Um, so um, this observation that history matters in uh, uh, history matters is of course history matters. History matters in the sense that if you were poor, there is there is a high chance that you can remain poor, but there is also the high chance that you can learn from the mistakes of the other, and you can go up to this go up on the uh, economic ladder, right? In the next class, we're going to talk about the income distribution in the developing countries. And we will start touching on the various facets of development in the developing countries, about the human development, about uh, the other structural parameters, like, for example, occupational structure uh, and uh, population structure, etc., rural urban migration, all of those things. Uh, we're going to talk about in the next classes. I think I'll take two or three classes uh, for the characteristics of the underdevelopment in these countries, in the in the developing countries and the underdeveloped countries. Right. So I hope uh, it was of some use to you. Thank you, Vita.